United Methodist Church. My name is Jay Clark. I'm one of the associate pastors on staff here. We're delighted that you've joined us for worship this morning. Uh, we are going to go right into the call to worship. If you will stand and join me in the call to worship as it's printed on the screen in front of you. We are a community embraced by the mystery of God's love for all creation. We are a community that looks for the light of Christ, the light that shines in every time, every place, and every life. Within this dynamic community, we foster connections and experiences that bring meaning to life and help us face the issues of our day. Together, we strive to live with loving hearts, open minds, and hands extended to all. We are a community bathed in love of God. song that we're going to sing is called A Place at the Table, and um, it's got some great lyrics to it. I really like it, and so um, it might be a little from unfamiliar to a lot of you all, so I'd like you to maybe listen to the first time through, uh, verse 1, and then the chorus, so you can kind of get the hang of it, and then join in uh, right there. Every 
everyone born a place at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and god will delight when we are creators of justice and joy yes god Justice and joy For woman and man For woman and man A place at the table Revising the roles Deciding the share With wisdom and grace Deciding the power a system that's fair, and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. part in the song, the hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled for young and for old, the right to belong, and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. For everyone born the right to be free And God will delight When we are creators of justice and joy Yes, God will delight When we are creators of justice Justice and joy turn to each other and share the peace and love of Christ this morning. As you're taking your seats, I'd like to invite any children that are here to come forward for our time with young Christians. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, is everybody awake? Okay. So here's what I was thinking about this morning. You're going to hear a little bit about this later when we read the scripture. What is this? Water. What does water do? It How does it help us? It makes us healthy. It makes us healthy, right? Very good answer. Anybody else? It's just an ordinary cup of water, right? Well, yes, ma'am. It can help us grow. It can help us grow. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else got an answer on what water is? Well, in the scripture today, we're going to hear it talk about Jesus being living water. Living water. 
Do you think this water's alive? No? Maybe if it had some bacteria in it or some little, <laughs> little, little things, it would have, you know, put it under a microscope, it could be living. But, uh, but basically, I can't pour this out and it's not going to walk out of the room, right? <laughs> no, that'd be silly, wouldn't it? But so what do you think living water is? If someone said that Jesus is living water, what does that even mean? Well, similar, because, you know, if you don't eat, if you don't eat donuts at church for months, you will still be alive, right? In fact, your body can survive, not as much when you're young like you because you need food to grow, but when you're old like all of us, you can go for, for weeks without eating and survive. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be fun, but you can survive. But do you know how long you can go without water? Not very long, just a few days. Just a few days. And so that's really what it's saying that, you know, we can go without food. We can go without doing a lot of things. But Jesus is living water because we, do you think we can go long without Jesus and have a happy life? I don't think so. As a Christian, I, I believe that Jesus and believing who Jesus is and following Jesus' example and trying to be like Jesus helps us to live the life that God wants us to live. Do you agree? You think that's true? What were you going to say? Did you have something you were going to say? What? Uh, that's, that, that's good. So when you drink water, and for those of you that didn't hear, her mother only allows her to drink water at the dinner table when, after she's had a full cup of juice. So... <laughs> words to live by now so will you do me a favor when you think about water every time you have water what I'd like you to do is think about Jesus being living water and every time you have a cup of water I want you to think how are you living your life to be like Jesus was Does that make sense all right so so when you have some water maybe you'll have some today I want you to think about that will you pray with me thank you God for being living water in our lives, for helping us grow, for helping us learn, for helping us be the best that we can be. Every time we drink water, help us to think of you and how you help us grow in our spiritual life as well and grow in our faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're going to Wesley Kids to sing, then you need to sign out in the back. You need a parent to sign you out. Thanks, everybody. Will you stand as you are able as we continue in worship? You know, last week, uh, this song, we were cut short um, from our simulcast. And so I, want, I was thinking more and more about the song, how this song, we, they'll know we are Christians by our love, uh, really can be a theme song for this sermon series. Uh, so we're going to sing it again this week and next week and the following week. Um, so please join in with this song. Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by. Our Other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And so know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And to God, human dignity and save human pride. And then know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Jesus, our only Son. 
sun and all praise to the spirit who makes us one and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by pray. Father God, we are grateful to be here in your presence. And, you know, sometimes we struggle to live our lives to show others your love, but they'll just know you if they can see you in us. Help us to hear what we need to hear today so that we may live according to your will. Amen. Today's scripture is from Revelation, the 22nd chapter. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So it doesn't feel real until you put a for sale sign in your front yard. Many of you heard a couple weeks ago that Arkansas Conference Bishop Muller is appointing me to serve a different church beginning in July. This means that I have to sell my house in Bryant. So on Monday, Mindy and I officially put our house on the market. And Monday morning, as the real estate agent was walking around taking pictures and asking me about different features in the house, and I would answer all of those questions, and then he asked me a question I wasn't prepared for. He said, well, what do you love most about this house? And I was taken aback. I said, well, honestly, it's the neighborhood. The things I will miss most about my house are the neighbors. We have had some of the best neighbors that anyone could ask for. Almost every other house has a kid within a year of either my son or my daughter's ages. Every other house, they take over the cul-de-sac and play together any time that there is an absence of raindrops. Our neighborhood is filled with the sounds of laughing and screaming and playing and bouncing balls and the clicks of a chain on a bicycle sprocket. We love our neighborhood. We trick-or-treat together. We message each other when one of us forgets to close the garage door, which happens a lot, or if the dog gets out from one of our homes. It's a real community. I also live in a neighborhood. I also love that my neighborhood is happily and proudly diverse. Almost every other house is black, white, black, white, black, white. Tommy and Devin were the first same-sex couple married in Pulaski County, and they live straight across the street from me. I love this for my children. I love that my daughter and my son can play in a neighborhood with kids who happen to be African-American, with kids who happen to have parents that are Republicans, with kids who happen to have parents that are Democrats, 
with kids who happen to have two dads or two moms, with kids who happen to live with a single mom or a single dad. I love this neighborhood because my kids are growing up around people that are different than they are. My kids are building relationships with children who are not the same. So my heart breaks a little to know that we are leaving this neighborhood. But my heart breaks even more to know that this kind of diversity in a neighborhood is uncommon. We have a tendency to surround ourselves and to live by people that are like us. We tend to self-segregate. Why is it that we segregate ourselves? Is it for comfort? Difference can often be uncomfortable. When we are different from the other, we, we don't share a common story. We don't identify in the same place. We have trouble seeing eye to eye with someone who is different. But I think perhaps that's why Jesus' message is so refreshing. Because he brought a new common story for all of us. Jesus brought an amazing new message of the good news of an inclusive God. Jesus created a faith community of nobodies, a diverse mix of nobodies. Jesus built relationships with underpaid day laborers, the racially oppressed, the sexually exploited, the financially discriminated, the diseased and abandoned Jesus proclaimed that this inclusive God has enough grace for everyone. There is no scarcity or shortage, no category or defect, no brokenness or offense that nullifies or obstructs access to this amazing saving grace of God. This faith community of nobodies found welcome, acceptance, and relationships with each other and with a God that sees them as somebodies. After the first Easter and the first resurrection, God raised inclusion and diversity up to level expert at Pentecost. As the winds blew people in from every nation around into Jerusalem, the breath of God spoke through the disciples so that every nation's people heard the good news, proclaimed in their language. This is perhaps the Bible's most amazing example of God's inclusivity. The Christian Jews, the Arabs, the Greeks, Romans, and even the Cretans heard about God's resurrecting grace in their native language. From the beginning, Christian community or as we call it, the church, was a mixed match, inclusive group of anybodies and nobodies. But somewhere along the way, churches started looking less like a mixed match group of the struggling and broken trying to heal together. This change can be traced back about 1,700 years to the early 300s of the Common Era, just a couple centuries after the book of Revelation was written and a little over two and a half centuries after the first Easter and Pentecost, a major tectonic shift quaked the identity of the Christian church. In 313 CE, religion and politics exchanged vows and rings in holy matrimony when the Roman emperor Constantine the Great signed the Edict of Milan to sanction Christianity as the religion of the state, persecution stopped, and Christianity became cloaked in favored status. Once the church became somebody, they forgot the nobodies. Once the church became somebody, they forgot the nobodies. As a result, Many faith communities have devolved into being a private organization of like-minded people. We've missed the point. The Bible is a 66-book library weaving a message from Genesis to Revelation 
giving us all that stuff about loving neighbors and enemies, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, being stewards of creation, and following God into a lifetime of mission and ministry. But after the first 65 books, we still find a way to miss the point. John of Patmos shares with us his revelation as the last book, the 66th book of the Bible, to bring us full circle to what God has been doing from the beginning. God creates the world, all of creation, including humanity, and calls it very good. And humans have managed throughout history to make this world less than good through our brokenness, corruption, and creative ways to screw up what God has so freely given us. We are prone to wonder. And every biblical prophet constantly calls people back to God, back to the work of being God's people. The good news continues that despite our repeated attempts to the contrary, God is constantly renewing, remaking, reforming, and resurrecting God's creation, even to the point of living among us in Jesus Christ to give us that most perfected example of how to properly live in this creation with God and each other. In the resurrection, we see validation of this new creation, a glimpse of the renewed and resurrected life in a new and resurrected world, the way it was meant to be from the beginning. The church's role is to be the agent through which God is already at work bringing in the kingdom. John's revelation simply announces to churches that they are struggling with the task, and we continue to struggle with the task. We continue to find ways to screw up, to miss the point, and to get in the way. Part of our calling is to get out of the way, to stop being a barrier and allow grace to resurrect the world. Today's reading from Revelation says, Let everyone who hears come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take in the water of life as a gift come. Anyone and everyone has a right to the tree of life and may enter the gates of the city. But for some reason, we begin to think that we're the gatekeeper, choosing who can and can't enter as religion and political power intertwine, we begin to think that we control the guest list for who gets in and who doesn't. Once the church became somebody, we forgot the nobodies. And the list, the list keeps growing of the unwelcomed and unwanted nobodies. We self-segregate. Many churches are more private clubs than inclusive communities. It was true 1,900 years ago when John of Patmos wrote Revelation, and it's still true now. Often the poor, the addict, the minority, and even the deforcee find that the gate is closed to them. After all, Sunday mornings tend to be the most segregated hour of the week still. After my grandfather and grandmother got a divorce, my grandfather stopped going to church and still hasn't found his way back because he was taught that divorce was such a horrible sin that he is no longer worthy of God's grace. We've gotten so good at being the gatekeeper that now we even pass laws about them. We legislate who's allowed to use the bathroom. We legislate one's freedom to discriminate and call it religious freedom. Instead of sharing God's grace, saying, let everyone come. We segregate. We limit access. We discriminate and say that we're doing it in the name of Christ. No wonder people run away and stay away from the church when, it's cited, when faith is cited as the reason 
that states like Mississippi and North Carolina enact new discriminatory legislation? Do they know that we are Christians by our love or by our hate and what we're against? In the next few months of a presidential election campaign, it will magnify our differences. And I suspect it will get ugly. It always does. And next month, our denomination will have its once per four year general conference to discuss and legislate the future of the United Methodist Church. It will also, it probably will also get ugly because it magnifies our differences. But I feel that we are better together, that we are a large, messy family, that there will be disagreements, but we're still a family. And I hope that we continue to be a family, navigating that awkwardness and messiness together. There's room at the table for all of us. And all of us have a place at that table with no exclusion, no membership requirements. I remember years ago when I went into nonprofit, I joined the Rotary Club. And somebody that was already in the Rotary Club had to vouch for me in order for me to join. The church is not Rotary Club. No one has to vouch for any of us in order for us to join. Jesus has already vouched for all of us, for you and for me, for each and every single one of us, especially for the neglected and the abused and the ignored and the discriminated. There's not a limited supply of grace. It's abundant. It's infinite. God's grace is unrestricted. It's an unrestricted flowing fount of every blessing offered and available to all, anyone and everyone, without restriction. If we review this Greek understanding of the word all that we see in Revelation, we will discover that all really means all. It really means everyone. It really means anyone. God's all-inclusive grace is not a political issue. It's not left or right or democratic or republican issue. Christ calls us to become community where we welcome and embrace the messiness and the awkwardness and the difference and the uncomfortable. It's my dream and my hope that the church will continue to be renewed, remade, reformed, and resurrected into a community where everyone has a place at the table. where all of my neighbors have a place at the table, my African-American neighbors, my gay neighbors, my Republican neighbors, my Democratic neighbors, my single mom neighbors, and my divorced grandfather would all find room at the table and a sincere welcome. God is reconciling and resurrecting the world into the new creation, whether we get in the way or not. Through the grace of God, we are all somebody. Nobody is a nobody. I find hope that the Bible closes with these words from Revelation saying that the resurrection will continue until everyone hears, everyone is welcomed, and everyone finds their way and finds their right to the tree of life, and everyone receives this fount of the water of life. As the final verses of Revelation says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And remember, all means all. Amen. As the ushers prepare to take up the offering, I would remind you to uh, place your gifts, your tithes, your offerings in the offering plate. I want to share with you those who came to the Easter sunrise service, our special offering went for Immerse, which reaches out to children that have aged out of foster and adoptive care. And we raised more than $7,500 to benefit Immerse and the amazing work that we do. Your gifts make a difference. 
Your gifts change lives. Will you continue to let God work through your gifts? Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your abundance of grace. Fill us with your spirit to know that grace more fully. Give us a gift of gratitude that we might pour out that grace and your gifts into the world that we might join you in saving the world and getting out of the way. We give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen.
folder that you got when you came in that it has a list of people, joys and concerns, those who have been hospitalized this week, those who uh, may have had uh, a death in their family, those who have joined the church, those who have given birth. So I invite you to lift those up as, uh, as you go out th throughout your week. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to add one name to the hospitalized list, and that's Charlie Tanner. Uh, Charlie's uh, grandparents attend this church, but uh, we know Charlie because she's a senior at Mount St. Mary and has, uh, uh, was in brain surgery yesterday. And so um, anyway, we, we stand by with our other communities of faith in lifting her up especially uh, as, uh, as she is dealing with this at, uh, at the hospital. Uh, will you go with me to God in prayer? God, you come to us and yet we fail to recognize you. Caught as we are in the trials and tribulations, in the sorrows and sins of, of this daily life of ours. You come to us in many ways. You come to us in the form of other Christian groups. You come to us in forms of groups that are working to save the holy site in Jerusalem described as the tomb of Jesus. You come to us in all refugees. You come to us as those suffering from yellow fever in Kenya and China, in those suffering from curable diseases because they can't afford the necessary medications. You come to us in those who are drawn to or, or pressed into violence and terrorism throughout the world. You come to us, O oh God, calling us to be agents of reconciliation, of health and healing, of justice and peace in our world, wherever we may be. You come to us in neighbor and stranger, in those who look like us and those who look very different from us, in those who speak our language and those who, whose language sounds so foreign to our ears. You come to us in the faces and lives of abused women and children. You come to us in the hopelessness of those living in poverty, wherever they may be, even as they look at the wealth which seems so far out of reach. You come to us, O oh God. May we be open to hearing your voice and to following your lead on this often difficult journey we call life. May it truly be so, as we remember the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Please stand as you are able as we close in song. Do I 
Thank you for joining us in worship today. At this time, I want to invite our newest members to come up as we invite them to join this congregation. They attended last week to our Membership Matters, and so they are joining with us this week. So we have Brad Moore, Tucker Moore, and Michelle Moore. Tucker's the talkative one. <laughs> So I have a question for you all as it comes up on the screen. Will you support, will you be faithful to the United Methodist Church <laughs> and to this congregation, upholding it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. will. And congregation, I invite you to respond. With joy, we welcome you into this family of faith, for we are all one in Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome. At the end of the service, in just a second, I invite you to come down and, uh, and make the Moors feel more at home. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist that one. If, you've been, if this is your first time to visit with us, then we have a welcoming gift for you on your way out. We hope you felt welcome. We hope you'll come back. If you're ready to explore membership like the Moors did, please join us at the next Membership Matters. That's May 15th. It's a Sunday at noon. Also, there's a whole bunch of announcements. Please read all of the things going on in the life of the church. If there's one thing to lift up, in two weeks, we are going to the baseball park. After church, it's like at 2 o'clock on April 24th. Bring your families. Here's the secret that's already printed. It's not really a secret. It's free. It includes your ticket and food, and it's free. Just let us know you're coming. We need a head count. So RSVP with us and come join us at the baseball park. It'll be just a great time in fellowship. And so that's everything on here, and I invite you now to receive this benediction. May you be filled with the overflowing abundance of the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, may you share that with all. And all means all. Share the love of Jesus Christ in the name of Christ. Amen. Welcome. <laughs>